Okay, good morning. Um, this is a subject that uh, we've visited a, a couple of times before, so uh, I apologize if you've heard some of this story before, but I always find I learn something when I do this talk, so hopefully the same goes uh, for you. Uh, I'd like to thank Tim, of course, for inviting me to come. It's uh, always a pleasure to come back to the UK. Um, but uh, of course, France has its uh, attractions, and I'm certainly uh, happy if anybody would ever think of visiting Lille. I'll show you around the vet school there. The questions that uh, Tim put to me today is do nerve blocks lie, which is a slightly different angle to this topic than the one I've taken before. And uh, without changing too much the angle that I've taken before, as you'll see in the rest of the talk, which is to explain how nerve blocks can help us, uh, I just want to touch on this first question initially. So my answer is nerve blocks don't lie, not if you know their limitations and if you interpret them correctly. And so it's true to say that in the last couple of years, predominantly through two things, the use of MRI, but also through the work of Anna-Marie Nagy at the Animal Health Trust at Bristol, that we've learned a bit more about the limitations of nerve blocks. Now, I'd like to stress this, that this is in an except, exceptional number of cases. So we're talking about exceptions rather than the rule. The rule is still that we can use our nerve blocks to guide us with the interpretation of the location of the pain. But as you will see, there are some exceptional cases where those rules are broken through the limitations of some of the techniques. So let's look at that first. This is an interesting statement that is a limitation. This comes out of the latest edition of Jörg Auer's textbook on equine surgery, where Anton Furst states that once a bottle of local anesthetic is opened, the effic efficacy of the drug diminishes rapidly, and therefore the bottle has to be used within a few days. I wasn't aware of that, but since I've read this, um, I'm obviously not making sure that I'm not using open bottles on consecutive days, and I try to uh, use a new bottle every day when I'm using lidocaine. Another limitation has come out of the work of Adam Regent Nagy, who's particularly focused on the proximal and distal diffusion of anything you inject perineurally in the distal limbs of the horse. And so as a substitute for local anesthesia, she's used contrast agents and methylene blue. The contrast agents were injected in the limbs of live horses, followed by radiography, and the methylene blue was used in cadaver limbs. And she's done a number of studies, not just on the distal limb, but also now more papers are coming out uh, the proximal limb. But we'll focus on some of her results. First, this one here. And the first thing to point out is that uh, two observations can be made on this work, uh, beginning with the observation on the image on the left here. You see that the contrast, rather than nicely following the neurovascular bundle, as outlined on the right of the slide, is actually accumulated in a patch here, which is not following the neurovascular bundle. And why is this? This is because around the nerve, superficial to the nerve, in a subcutaneous location, sits a perineural fascia. And this perineural fascia prevents what you inject to come into contact with the nerve and to follow the nerve proximal distally. So although it tends to locate and focus what you've injected around the area of the injection, as you can see here, it also prevents it from diffusing into the nerve and taking effect. And so this subcutaneous rather than subfascial injection can be a cause for delayed onset of anything inject, you inject around the nerve. On the opposite side of it is, if you do inject deep enough and you do inject perineurally, then you're going to see very quickly that what you inject, any liquid you inject, is going to follow the neurovascular bundle in a proximal distal direction. And in this study, they measured proximal diffusion and distal diffusion, and they found that in function of time, this distance increased. They had about 50% of the horses where there was significant proximal and distal diffusion, and the diffusion proximally was up to 28 millimeters from the site of injection at 10 minutes, but up to 36 minutes from the site of injection at 30 minutes. Funnily enough, walking the horses did not seem to make a difference to the amount of diffusion. 
Distal diffusion was always more than proximal diffusion. So that's certainly something worth keeping in mind, and it can, it can explain some of the um, aberrations that we find occasionally in interpreting, interpreting our nerve boxes, I'll show you in a minute. They repeated this study higher up, so this first study was done at the level of the abaxial sesamoid nerve block here, the palmar nerves, at the level of the fetlock, you can just see the needle here. And then they did another study where they followed the behavior of the contrast medium injected at the level of the low four-point nerve block. Of course, they were keeping in mind the fact that anything that diffuses proximally might be able to take away some of the sensitivity or the sensation at the level of the insert the attachment of the suspensory ligament to the palmar cortex of the third metacarpal bone. And so they measured e proximal diffusion distances up to eight centimeters, 80 millimeters, with low four-point nerve blocks. And uh, so their, <coughs> their uh, recommendations were that nerve blocks should be assessed within five minutes, or as soon as possible, to avoid the loss of specificity through proximal diffusion and that delayed onset of anesthesia might be due to a, an injection that's performed too superficially and has not managed to breach the perineural fascia. They also then went on to state that in spite of the fact that they measured diffusions up to eight centimeters proximally, which to me seems a distance that's going to take it very close to the attachment of the suspension ligament in this area, they concluded that in the in general, the main contrast patch rarely uh, surmounted the mid-metacarpal level, and so they concluded that it was therefore unlikely to affect pain in the suspensory ligament. I'm not sure I agree entirely with that statement, but based on this observation, they obviously made that point. And then they found one other thing with the low four-point nerve block is that on cadaver legs, up to 40% of the injection breached the digital sheath and local anesthetic, or at least contrast medium was found in the digital sheath, which could be another reason to explain why sometimes the low four-point nerve block hasn't taken because your local anesthetic has actually gone into the digital sheath rather than around the nerve you're trying to inject. And I don't know about you, but in my practice I find that uh, low four-point nerve blocks often have to be repeated or topped up, shall we say, before they fully take effect, which of course adds another variable to this diffusion question. So diffusion does occur following injection. And uh, what is the clinical implication of this? And I think at the hand of this paper that appeared at the uh, uh, convention of the American Association of Equine Practitioners last December in California, you'll understand what the implications are. These people here, a group around Natasha Worthy, who uh, represented at that time Colorado State University, these people reported on 15 horses that had undergone foot MRIs on the basis that the referring veterinarian had identified a foot lameness based on the response to a palmar digital nerve. So what I'm saying is these are 15 horses that have proved 80, 90% or more to a palmar digital nerve block were referred for an MRI, nothing was found in the foot, the fetlock was then scanned, and a significant lesion was found at the level of the fetlock. You will ask me, well, how did you know that that lesion was significant? Well, we know from these 15 horses that the lesion was, because subsequently, all these horses went sound or were significantly improved following <coughs> intra-articular anesthesia of fetlock. Now, I I want to stress this again, that even though there are 15 horses in this series, Natasha Worthy in particular reads thousands of MRI studies. And so therefore, it is an exception to the rule rather than the rule. But it needs to be remembered that this is possible. Okay, so that's why I said 15 horses out of more than a thousand MRIs. So that's what I just said. We're diagnosed with primary fetlock joint lesions that subsequently block the intra-articular anesthesia. We've had a couple of these recently. Uh, a couple of examples here. Uh, on your left, a horse with a fissure fracture, an incomplete compular fracture in the fetlock. Nobody needs to explain. This doesn't need explaining as to the significance of this. There's not much doubt about it. This horse was positive 
to a proximal, what they call in France, a proximal palmar digital nerve block, which is sort of halfway between the palmar digital nerve block and the abaxial sesamoid nerve block. And the veterinarian who referred the horse was insistent that we would scan the foot and not the fetlock. And uh, obviously we didn't find anything in the foot. So that's why we went on and scanned the fetlock subsequently. This horse was interesting. We've scanned it twice. These lesions have not changed. I apologize slightly, but the horse wouldn't stand still very well. But in spite of that, we still see very clearly uh, very reactive bone edema in the dorsal aspect of the sagittal ridge and also in the proximal area of the sagittal groove of the proximal phalanx in this horse. This horse was on two occasion, occasions positive to a pastoral ring block. No lesions were found in the foot. So, um, as far as the question, do nerve blocks lie or not? Again, I think not, uh, as long as you're aware of the limitations and you interpret them correctly. So a couple of <coughs> things that we can list here is false positives and false negative findings. First are false positives, a failure to appreciate that a horse warms out of the lamus. This is sometimes a problem with intermittent lamuses, lamuses that are more prominent when the horse first comes out of the stall and then gets better progressively as you trot it up. So that's something we need to be aware of. Failure to reevaluate the lameness within an appropriate time. So if you're doing two lamenesses at the same time or three, you get called away for a phone call, you go send a quick email. By the time you've come back, it's way beyond the 10 minutes you initially planned to look at that horse again. The nerve block may have diffused proximally and affected other areas that you were not intending to block. And so for, therefore your conclusions may end up being wrong. A clinician bias, a bias due to expectation that the horse should get better. I always find and tell the students that this is particularly important on a Friday afternoon. You do want to get the horse to get better so that you can conclude your examination. And so uh, this has now actually been proven to be the case um, with a, a, an interesting study that was done at the Royal Vending College, I believe it was, where uh, they distributed uh, videos of lame horses to clinicians and uh, without, partially without and partially with the knowledge as to which horses had been blocked and which had not been blocked. And it turned out that people who had previous knowledge that the horse had been blocked were more inclined to see an improvement on these videos than people who were unaware whether the horse had been blocked or not. And this is one of the reasons why I always try to use lameness locator for any hindling lameness that I look at now. But that's a different story. False negatives. Local anesthetic solution could inadvertently and unknowingly be injected in a different anatomical structure, a blood vessel, the tendon sheath, a joint where you were actually intending to do a perineural injection. Misdirection of a needle causing deposition, uh, like I've just said, in a synovial structure. Misdirection of a needle causing deposition of the anesthetic outside the fascia, which will then delay the onset of the anesthetic and failure of intraarticular anesthesia due to the presence of subcondal pain, bone pain in the absence of overlying cartilage abnormalities. That, that's a bit of a mystery, but that's an explanation that we sometimes use to explain why uh, some horses with joint pain don't get better following intraarticular anesthesia. And again, that story about clinician bias. As with everything, there are some cynics that always look on the negative side and then there are those that always want to see something positive in things and with nerve blocks that might not always be an advantage. Okay, so I think with that I've tried to answer the question that Tim put to me which was do nerve blocks lie? And I've tried to illustrate that they don't really if you are aware of their <laughs> limitations and pitfalls. In the second part of my talk I would like to explain some of the ways that we've tried to elucidate how they can be helpful.